The biggest change from the SD35 was a longer underframe with the length over the coupler pulling faces increased from 60 feet 8 inches on the SD35 to either 65 feet 8 inches or 65 feet 9.5 inches depending on whether the end plates were 0.75 inches or 1.5 inches thick. On the SD45, the 20-cylinder engine and longer radiators with flared intakes took up all of the additional frame length, but on the three other models, the shorter hood left porches at either end that, while not as long as on the later SD40-2, still left several feet of empty walkway space. The longer underframe allowed for a significantly longer fuel tank with a standard fuel capacity of 4,000 gallons, although smaller tanks were sometimes used. The walkway side frame was 5 inches tall above the air reservoirs compared to 3 inches on the SD35, and air piping was relocated inboard of the air reservoirs as on the last SD35 orders for the Southern Railway. Also like the GP40, the increase from 2,500 to 3,000 horsepower necessitated a larger radiator section with three 48-inch fans in place of the one 36-inch and two 48-inch fans on the SD35. The SD40 adopted the general hood dimensions and radiator design of the last two SD40X demonstrators, but also lengthened the front hood section housing the inertial air intakes and equipment blower duct by about 15 inches. The taper of the dynamic brake hatch was made steeper at the rear than the front to make room for the longer radiator intakes. Aside from these changes, the cabin hood were very similar between the late SD35 and early SD40. As on the SD28, the SD38 used the same hood design as the SD40 but incorporated shorter radiator intakes with only two 48-inch fans and two exhaust stacks in place of a single turbocharger stack. The SD38-2, SD40-2, and SD45-2 were introduced in 1972 as replacements for the SD38, the SD40, and the SD45 respectively. They retained the same respective horsepower ratings but received a host of mechanical and electrical upgrades with the most visible difference being the longer frame with HTC trucks. While the SD38-2 and SD45-2 were relatively slow sellers and ceased production in the 1970s, Thousands of the SD40-2 variations were built as it became the most popular locomotive of the late 20th century and as of the title of this video states, the greatest diesel locomotive ever built with peak production in the late 1970s and the last variant, the full cowl SD40-2F built in 1988. The SD38-2 and SD40-2 were very similar externally with the relatively long frame and short hood resulting in a large porches at either end. The SD38-2 had two radiator fans and two exhaust stacks while the SD40-2 had three radiator fans and a single turbocharger exhaust stack which was changed to a flat silencer housing on later units. The SD45-2 had a single exhaust stack and three radiator fans spread out over a distinctively longer hood that filled the extra frame length. Tunnel motor variants, the SD40-T-2 and SD45-T-2, rode on a still longer frame and had a redesigned radiator area with low air intakes, internal fans, and roof-mounted radiator grills. Wide-nosed units that were built for Canadian National were otherwise similar to other SD40-2s, but the full cowl body SD40-2F built for Canadian Pacific was in fact closely derived from the SD50F built for the Canadian National, and its car body and general construction had little in common with other SD40-2s.
On all six axle dash two units, the frame was lengthened by just over three feet to accommodate the longer HTC trucks while keeping enough room for the standard 4,000 gallon fuel tank. Depending on the thickness of the pilot end plates, either 0.75 inches or one and a half inches, the overall length was either 68 feet eight and a half inches or 68 feet 10 inches compared to the 65 feet eight inches or 65 feet nine and a half inches for the SD38, SD40, and the SD45. The SD40 T-2 and SD45 T-2 were built to an overall length of 70 feet eight inches with one and a half inch end plates. The HTC truck looked superficially similar to the earlier flexi-coil truck, but it was a substantially different design with an all-new frame casting, taller primary springs, stiffer rubber pads for the secondary suspension, slightly unequal axle spacing, and all traction motors facing in the same direction, which was the reason for the added length. The wheelbase between the center axles, often mistakenly cited as 43 feet 6 inches, was in fact 43 feet 3 and a half inches. The 43 feet 6 inch dimension was for the bolster centers as the bolster on HTC trucks was offset outward by 1 and a quarter inches from the center axle. The longer frame was retained on Conrail units that were built with flexi-coil trucks, leaving a large gap between the trucks and the fuel tank. Railroad diagrams list the bolster centers on flexi-coil equipped units as 43 feet 6 inches, but as the flexi-coil bolster lined up with the middle axle, such a dimension would put the trucks too far toward the ends and possibly cause greater clearance issues with the steps and draft gear. On all 6 axle dash 2 units, the front section of the hood housing the inertial air intakes and blower duct was lengthened by roughly 8 inches. On the SD38-2 and SD40-2, this added length was not enough to compensate for the increased frame length, and the result was a significantly larger platform at either end, with the rearmost wheel entirely out from under the end of the hood. On the SD45-2, however, the rear of the hood was also lengthened to fill up the extra frame length, and the added space was used to house longer, narrower radiators that did not require the canted intakes used on the SD45. The longer radiators resulted in three very widely spaced rooftop radiator fans. At the start of the EMD-2 production, almost every part of the cab and hood was changed in some way. The SD40-2 was widely heralded as the greatest diesel locomotive that was ever built. Many Class 1 railroads have bumped them to yard and local service, and over on the NS, the SD60E, which had replaced the SD60Ms and the SD60Is in coal service and mineral service, are now replacing the 40s in many local jobs.
The transition from the GMD SD40 to the SD40-2 was generally the same as for their EMD counterparts. Most of the phase changes occurred at the same time as an EMD SD40-2 production, although a few minor changes occurred later. Some of the features generally associated with GMD locomotive production, such as vertical corner steps and nose-mounted headlights, were more a question of railroad specifications than of differences from EMD. When GMD built several orders of SD40-2s for Burlington Northern while EMD was at capacity, they were virtually identical to their U.S. built counterparts. Likewise, when EMD built an order of early Canadian Pacific SD40-2s, they were built to GMD CP specs. Formed in 1971, Amtrak took over operation of most of America's passenger trains with an assortment of old locomotives, primarily decades-old E-units. The carrier worked with General Motors' Electromotive Division to design new passenger locomotives. The result was the SDP-40F, built by EMD from 1973 through 1974 for Amtrak for a brief time they formed the backbone of Amtrak's long-distance passenger fleet. With 150 built, the STP-40F became the face of Amtrak in the mid-1970s as they were found on the head ends of passenger trains from San Diego to Washington, D.C. and from Seattle to Miami. Several were rebuilt and found a second life with the Santa Fe Railway in freight service. The design of the STP-40F was based on the EMD FP-45 passenger locomotive. Both shared the EMD 645 E3 diesel engine, although the SDP-40F had 16 cylinders instead of 20. The space saved from the smaller prime mover was given over to increased water capacity. The SDP-40F had an underbody tank split between water and diesel fuel carrying 2,000 gallons of water and 2,500 gallons of diesel. A second 1,500-gallon water tank sat in the car body forward of the steam generators which produced the steam needed for supplying heat and sometimes cooling and hot water for the train. Eventually, the SDP-40F was phased out as all electric cars such as the Amfleet displaced the old steam heating rolling stock. While the SDP-40F was designed with conversion to head-end power in mind, the bad press they received cost to upgrade and overhaul the units and Amtrak's satisfaction with the versatility of the HEP-equipped F40PH ultimately doomed the SDP-40F. Amtrak was able to trade in the SDP-40F's two EMD as more F40PH units were acquired in the late 1970s. The last SDP-40F was retired from Amtrak in the early 1980s. In 1984, the Santa Fe Railway traded lower power locomotives to Amtrak for 18 SDP-40Fs, horsepower for horsepower. The SDP-40Fs were reconditioned in the railroad San Bernardino, California shops to the designation of the SDF. 40-2 for use as freight locomotives. Santa Fe replaced the hollow HTC bolsters with conventional HTC bolsters, converted the below-frame combination fuel water tank to an all-fuel tank, 
Remove the above frame water tanks, replacing these with concrete ballast, something that you often see on today's slug units, and use the engines for nearly 50 years. They were also given front steps and platforms. Their noses were notched after a second maintenance shop visit in order to improve boarding access. In exchange, Amtrak received 43 smaller locomotives for use in switching service. I think that a major issue at EMD during this transition time from the Dash 2 era was how long EMD had stuck with their successful product lineups. By the time they decided to replace them and introduce a new model line, much of the engineering staff that was experienced with past model introductions had retired or moved on to New Horizons. What was left was an engineering base that predominantly had never designed and brought to life a new model of locomotive. Faced with an almost impossible task to live up to, expectations set by what many consider the greatest locomotive design of all time with the SD40-2. And after so many years of living off of the laurels of EMD's GP38, SD40, and GP40 line and the subsequent Dash 2 versions, they naturally faltered. Customers that had gotten accustomed to the problem-free EMD suddenly didn't have such a great memory anymore and had no patience to see the teething troubles out with new locomotives, with several notables leaving the fold at this time and others upping the percentage of GEs that were being bought. Yet ironically, it was the SD60s that soured CSX on EMDs after being reasonably pleased with the SD50s. Go figure. That's a relationship that, to this day, LaGrange has yet to really restore, with just small orders here and there since then. The CNW is another one that was less than pleased, at least in the service that they were initially intended for, despite a very unpleasant experience with seven U30Cs in the 1970s, they switched to GE in the wake of their SD60 order, although the relationship couldn't have been too badly damaged because if you recall, had the CNW had remained an independent railroad, the SD80 Max were in their future. Santa Fe was upset by how rough riding the GP60 turned out to be. It makes you wonder how could EMD that had been turning out wide cab locomotives for the Canadian National in 4-axle and 6-axle models screw up so badly on that one. Then throw in EMD insisting for years on staying with the one inverter per truck while GE was offering the one inverter per axle. We talked about this in my first volume of my EMD vs. GE series with the SD70 Mac vs. the AC4400 CW. The simple fact was that GE started offering a better product, at least for a time anyway. Except for the Burlington Northern and Union Pacific's major orders, there really weren't any EMD orders of more than 300 units at one time. Now to be fair, GE's B40-AWs rode about as bad as the GP60Ms, as both were exceptionally rough riding. Both the GP60M and the B40-AWs were renowned for their rough riding characteristics, truck hunting and bouncing at grade crossings and crossovers. Yeah, everything I've read says that Dash 8s were at best marginally better behaved than the 60Ms, and both were horrible. Also, everything I've read about the GP40-2Ls and especially the GP40-2Ws was that they were close to, if not as bad as the GP60Ms. So I guess the Santa Fe knew what they were getting for their money. The Santa Fe wanted a design that was going to bounce a lot. I guess they knew that up front because the CN units rode rough too. EMD and GE both did their best to account for that. But again, they were what the Santa Fe asked for and both companies built rough riding units, so that's not an indicator of the problem. I can't help but wonder why all the GP60s and 60Ms and SD70Is and SD70Ms are getting rebuilt on the BINCEP if they're so bad. But I'm guessing in the case of the GP60Ms, I'm pretty sure the answer is CARB, the California Air Resources Board and the BNSF and Union Pacific voluntarily agreed with them on some kind of fleet emission standards. Furthermore, the Santa Fe bought 83-840BWs and 63 GP60Ms plus 23 Jeep60Bs. The 60Ms was the lower horsepower locomotive which would mean a slower train speed overall. They also bought 102 SD75Is and Ms, a unit specifically designed for the Santa Fe that upped the horsepower of the SD70M because Santa Fe wanted EMD to match the Dash 9s. The GP60Ms are still on the roster today. The Dash 8s of all flavors mostly are not.
The GP60Ms and Dash 840BWs ride rough because they are very heavy for four axles and have the heavy cab on one end. Santa Fe might not have asked for a rough riding unit, who knows, but that is what they received after specifying those parameters. The Jeep60Ms are being rebuilt for use as local power where they've been for years, and they are cleaner burning than BNSF's other four axles, which keeps carb happy. A lot of the four axle Dash 8s are still around on the BNSF, though they're steadily, steadily dwindling. The SD70M-2 units without the isolated cab are loud and are called a real paint shaker. We talked about these in Volume 3 of EMD vs. GE, the first part of the SD70 ACE versus the ES44 AC. The ones with the isolated cab are much better, but I'm told they're still not that great. The SD70 and 75 units are good pullers, but I'm told they slip in the slightest amount of moisture on the rails. But they're real crew favorites on the Canadian National. So, what exactly are we looking at? We are looking at another lease unit. This time it's on the Canadian National. That is GCFX number 6057. You know, it's kind of funny. Somebody once told me Canadian National and Canadian Pacific hate each other up there the way that NS and CSX hate each other down here. And in this case, they each seem to have their own preference of lease locomotive. What's interesting about the 6057 is that it started off as a Canadian National locomotive. So it was born a Canadian National locomotive, it became a lease locomotive, it was leased back to Canadian National, and then it went on to other railroads, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. It was built in May of 1971 as Canadian National number 5193 as an SD40, a straight SD40 with no dynamic brakes. Keep that in mind. It was built as a straight SD40 with no dynamic brakes. Looking at this picture here, you can see the flexi-coil style trucks that were popular on Conrail SD40-2s and also their SD50s. The SD60s had the new HTCR trucks, I believe that's what they, yeah, yeah, the new HTCR trucks that Conrail SD60s had. Looking behind the cab, you can see the louvers over the air intakes there. I don't know what the techn technically correct term is for those. I always call them snow sheds. But some American locomotives had them too. I'm pretty sure that the Sioux Line had some engines that had those. And I think the CNW, the Chicago Northwestern, had some engines that had them. And there might have been some other ones too. I, I could be wrong on that, but I think at least those two did have them. You typically see these on locomotives that deal with cold weather, particularly up north. And a lot of snow, because that's what they're for. They're, they're for to keep snow out of those air intakes. So moving along here, we're looking at uh, 31T getting ready to head into Solomon's Gap. And from there, it'll cruise on down the hill and it'll, it will end up at a place called Laurel Run. Now Laurel Run is a place that will forever live in infamy in Lehigh Valley history because Lehigh Valley and CNJ history because there was a big accident here back in, I want to say it was 1969, but uh, you know what, I, I can't remember the year, but there was a big accident. A CNJ train and a Lehigh Valley train collided head on. And what was unusual about the accident, about the incident, was the fact that only Alco diesels were involved in the wreck. There were no EMD or GE diesels involved. It was all Alcos. But nonetheless, getting back to this engine here. So what exactly do we know about this engine? Well, we know that it was built as a straight SD40 in May of... 1971 for the Canadian National, it was rebuilt into the SD40-3 that you see here by a company, a French company in Canada that was rebuilding and testing locomotives, that company being Alstom, which was reorganized in 1998. During the rebuilding process, it had dynamic brakes added to it, and it was painted the in the orange or gray scheme that you see here, and was leased back to the Canadian National in the late 1990s. From Canadian National, it went to the Quebec Gatineau Railway in Montreal, Quebec. And now, where's the number 3334 that you see here? Interesting about the Quebec Gatineau Railway, it's a relatively new railroad that was formed in the late 90s, 1998 if I'm not mistaken, from former Canadian Pacific Lines. Now, I know I'm going to butcher this, so I'm going to put it up on the screen for you, but the lines that it took over from CP was the Trois Revere and Lachute subdivisions, God forbid, between Quebec City and Montreal, and some lines also in Gatineau. 
spurs, running rights, stuff like that. When you when you take when you take all that into consideration, the railroad is just under three hundred miles, two hundred ninety eight to be exact, if I'm not mistaken. 